Sermon 46 of Leo the Great, Bishop of Rome. Translated by Charles Let Felto. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 46 on Lent 8. 1. Lent must be kept not only by avoiding bodily impurity, but also by avoiding errors of thought and faith. We know indeed, dearly beloved, your devotion to be so warm that in the fasting, which is the forerunner of the Lord's Easter, many of you will have forestalled our exhortations. But because the right practice of abstinence is needful not only to the mortification of the flesh, but also to the purification of the mind, we desire your observance to be so complete that, as you cut down the pleasures that belong to the lusts of the flesh, so you should banish the errors that proceed from the imaginations of the heart. For he whose heart is polluted with no misbelief prepares himself with true and reasonable purification for the paschal feast, in which all the mysteries of our religion meet together. For, as the Apostle says that all that is not of faith is sin, the fasting of those will be unprofitable and vain, whom the father of lying deceives with his delusions, and who are not fed by Christ's true flesh as then we must with the whole heart obey the divine commands and sound doctrine, so we must use all foresight in abstaining from wicked imaginations. For the mind then only keeps holy and spiritual fast when it rejects the food of error and the poison of falsehood, which our crafty and wily foe plies us with more treacherously now, when by the very return of the venerable festival the whole church generally is admonished to understand the mysteries of its salvation. For he is the true confessor and worshipper of Christ's resurrection, who is not confused about his passion, nor deceived about his bodily nativity. For some are so ashamed of the gospel of the cross of Christ as to impudently nullify the punishment which he underwent for the world's redemption, and have denied the very nature of true flesh in the Lord, not understanding how the impassable and unchangeable deity of God's word could have so far condescended for man's salvation, as by his power not to lose his own properties, and in his mercy to take on him ours. And so in Christ there is a twofold form, but one person. And the Son of God, who is at the same time Son of Man, is one Lord, accepting the condition of a slave by the design of loving-kindness, not by the law of necessity because by his power he became humble, by his power passable, by his power mortal, that for the destruction of the tyranny of sin and death the weak nature in him might be capable of punishment, and the strong nature not lose aught of its glory. 2. All the actions of Christ reveal the presence of the twofold nature. And so, dearly beloved, when, in reading or hearing the gospel, you find certain things in our Lord Jesus Christ subjected to injuries, and certain things illumined by miracles, in such a way that in the same person now the humanity appears, and now the divinity shines out. Do not put down any of these things to a delusion, as if in Christ there is either manhood alone or Godhead alone. But believe both faithfully, worship both right humbly, so that in the union of the word and the flesh there may be no separation, and the bodily proofs may not seem delusive, because the divine signs were evident in Jesus. The attestations to both natures in him are true and abundant, and by the depth of the divine purpose all concur to this end, that the inviolable word not being separated from the passable flesh, the Godhead may be understood as in all things, partaker with the flesh and the flesh with the Godhead. And, therefore, must the Christian mind that would eschew lies and be the disciple of truth, use the gospel story confidently, and, as if still in company with the apostles themselves, distinguish what is visibly done by the Lord, now by the spiritual understanding, and now by the bodily organs of sight. A sign to the man that he was born a boy of a woman. A sign to God that his mother's virginity is not harmed, either by conception or by bearing. Recognize the form of a slave, enwrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, but acknowledge 
that it was the Lord's form that was announced by angels, proclaimed by the elements, adored by the wise men. Understand it of his humanity that he did not avoid the marriage feast. Confess it divine that he turned water into wine. Let your own feelings explain to you why he shed tears over a dead friend. Let his divine power be realized when that same friend, after moldering in the grave four days, is brought to life and raised only by the command of his voice. To make clay with spittle and earth was a work of the body, but to anoint therewith and enlighten the eyes of the blind is an undoubted mark of that power which had reserved for the revelation of its glory that which it had not allowed to the early part of his natural life. It is truly human to relieve bodily fatigue with rest and sleep, but it is truly divine to quell the violence of raging storms by a rebuking command. To set food before the hungry denotes human kindness and a philanthropic spirit, but with five loaves and two fish to satisfy five thousand men, besides women and children, who would dare deny that to be the work of deity? A deity which, by the cooperation of the functions of true flesh, showed not only itself in manhood, but also manhood in itself. For the old original wounds in man's nature could not be healed, except by the word of God taking to himself flesh from the virgin's womb, whereby in one and the same person flesh and the word coexisted. 3. Hold fast to the statements of the Creed. This belief in the Lord's incarnation, dearly beloved, through which the whole church is Christ's body, hold firm with heart unshaken, and abstain from all the lies of heretics, and remember that your works of mercy will only then profit you, and your strict continence only then bear fruit, when your minds are unsoiled by any defilement from wrong opinions. Cast away the arguments of this world's wisdom, for God hates them, and none can arrive by them at the knowledge of the truth. And keep fixed in your mind that which you say in the Creed. Believe the Son of God to be co-eternal with the Father, by whom all things were made, and without whom nothing was made, born also according to the flesh at the end of the times. Believe him to have been in the body crucified, dead, raised up, and lifted above the heights of heavenly powers, set on the Father's right hand, about to come in the same flesh in which he ascended, to judge the living and the dead. For this is what the Apostle proclaims to all the faithful, saying, If ye be risen with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are upon the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. For when Christ our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 4. Use Lent for general improvement in the whole round of Christian duties. Relying, therefore, dearly beloved, on so great a promise, be heavenly not only in hope, but also in conduct. And though our minds must at all times be set on holiness of mind and body, Yet now, during these forty days of fasting, bestir yourselves to yet more active works of piety, not only in the distribution of alms, which are very effectual in attesting reform, but also in forgiving offenses, and in being merciful to those accused of wrongdoing, that the condition which God has laid down between himself and us may not be against us when we pray. For when we say, in accordance with the Lord's teaching, Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. We ought with the whole heart to carry out what we say. For then only will what we ask in the next clause come to pass, that we may not be led into temptation and freed from all evils. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. End of Sermon 46